think it's my pleasure with the secret. Oh, it does. Okay, good. Uh, so I've got it down here. Uh, we're going to be looking in your notes here, in your student uh, resource guide. We're going to be looking at, where is it? Page number 132. 132, principle number 8. That's what we'll be looking at tonight. Before we do that, though, I want to just take a look at uh, the formula for freedom. This is not in your notes here on page 132. Uh, but this is something that we've looked at before, and uh, I really like the verse here. This is kind of, these are one, some of the foundational verses for the RU program. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In these verses, we find a formula of sorts. And it's not just as simple as step one, step two, step three, you know, it's not quite like that, but it's, the idea is that all of these elements will be present when you are free, okay? So that's what I want you to think. All of these elements are present when you are free. And, uh, and so let's just kind of break this down a little bit, of course, the uh, verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So it is Jesus that makes you free. If he's the one that makes us free, then what does he say about that freedom? Well, he says a couple things here. First of all, he says that you've got to believe on him. All right? You'll never be truly free if you don't believe on him. That, that doesn't just mean accept that he truly was some historical figure. But that means that you will depend on on Jesus. Depend on him for your salvation. Depend on him for everything. So freedom is present when, first of all, you are a believer. You believe on Jesus. Then you continue in his word. You won't be free if you're not in this book. You won't be free. And you know what? You will find when you relapse, when you go back, chances are you are in this book, aren't you? I know that in my life, and you've seen it in your life. Jesus tells us, according to that verse, continue in my word, he says. Be his disciple. Then are you my disciples indeed, Jesus says. So be a disciple. What does that mean? That means follow Jesus. So don't just study the word, but when Jesus points something out to you in the word, then you take some steps and actually follow after it. When he says, I want you to do this, when he points out this and that, then you say, all right, that's for me. I'm following after Jesus. Remember principle number one, if God's against it, so am I. Uh, and so when Jesus points something out to us, we follow that. We follow that. And then finally, you will know the truth. You will know the truth. Uh, that is, you will have a relationship with the one who is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when, when you know Jesus in a personal way because you believe on him, you continue in his word and you are his disciple, then you will have this knowledge of him that's not just information of the brain, but a relationship with him. And if you know the truth, then the truth shall set you free. And that is it. In, that, in those couple of verses, uh, we really find a great formula for freedom. And it's all about relationship, not information. It's relationship. Well, you can get this book, well, you can memorize this book. Well, go ahead. But that won't do it. It's got to be a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is just a tool. This is just a tool so that you can know God personally through Jesus Christ. All right, let me see if I can get this going to the next. Here we go. Is it going to work for me now? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. All right, I got it. Ten principles. Ten principles to conquer stubborn habits. We're talking about addictions here. And uh, by the way, all sin is addictive. All sin is addictive. And uh, you continue with any kind of sin and keep feeding into that sin, and you will find yourself addicted to it, no matter how big or small it is. So how do we conquer these addictions? Uh, well, we've got 10 principles here that we like to teach that help us. We find that these 10 principles are kind of like boundaries to freedom. Everyone who's free 
understands that freedom exists within boundaries. There are always boundaries to freedom. There is no freedom that has no boundaries. And so you find out what are the boundaries. And when you understand the boundaries of the freedom that Jesus freely gives to you, then you can maintain that freedom. These principles that we're finding in the Word of God, according to James 1, 26, the, the law of liberty, the boundaries of freedom, is the Word of God. And according to the Word of God, we're finding several principles. We've looked at number one, if God's against it, so am I. Great principle. Remember this one. Number two, every sin has its origin in our hearts. What you think is what you do. Okay? So it starts with your meditations. Then number three, it's easier to keep the heart clean than to clean it after it's been defiled. Don't wait till it's a big deal and then, oh boy, now i got to fix it. Stop. No. Deal with it when it's small. When it's small, keep your heart clean. Think about what you're meditating on and what you're giving your heart to. Then number four, we cannot fight a fleshly appetite by indulging in it. It's a lie of the devil that says, just one more time, I'm going to be happy. It's a lie of the devil. Don't believe it. You cannot fight that appetite by indulging in it. Number five, small compromises lead to great disasters. The compromises are when God points out something small that you know you should do, and you say, eh, it's not that big of a deal, I can live without it. You're compromising. When you make that little compromise, and you say, I'm not going to read my Bible today. Eh, I'm not gonna, whatever. Those little compromises lead to big disasters in your life. They grow to huge sins. Remember what the Bible says to him that knows to do good and do it if not. To him it is sin. That's what the Bible says to you. And so when God points out something to you, small it may be, do not compromise. You stick with it. You stick with it. Number six, we looked at this. Those who do not love the Lord will not help me serve the Lord. And uh, when you start living for Him, they will naturally distance themselves from you. And you can let them go. It's okay. God's given you plenty more friends. He's given you a new family. Uh, and so it, you're, you'll be fine with that. You know, and you think, oh, I want to reach them with the gospel. Well, you live your life according to gospel principles. They'll distance themselves from you. And then when they hit bottom and realize, man, I remember my friend. His life was changed. I want to be like him. And look to you. Okay? You don't have to worry. You don't have to, you don't have to try to keep them around. No, 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 no. Let them go. For God's sake. For your relationship with him. Let them go. And then God can bring them back in due time. If that's his plan. Number seven, we saw our sinful habits do hurt those who follow us. People that we know use our sinful examples as an excuse to dip into sin themselves. And so we've got to understand this principle that our, our decisions have consequences, not just in our own life, but in the lives of others around us. And boy, we could all tell stories about mistakes that other people have made that have seriously affected our lives. Well, don't forget about that. Don't you become the same problem in somebody else's life. You know what I'm saying? Our simple habits do hurt those who follow us. Here we are, number eight. We made it. Page 132. That was 15 minutes of review. <laughs> okay. Well, we sang a song in there too, so give me a break. All right, here we are, number <laughs> number eight, page one thirty-two. It is not possible to fight a fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. It is not possible. This principle is so foundational. This principle is is probably the reason that the RU program exists. Because everyone in the world is trying to come up with a method, a, a solution to habitual sinful behavior, to addictions in our lives. And, and everybody's trying to come up with a solution to it, but they're not attacking it the right way. You see, they're trying to use their own flesh to beat back the flesh, and that doesn't work. 
It doesn't work. It never will. And that's what makes the RU program so unique among all recovery programs. Because we choose here to attack the problem in the only way that can actually defeat the problem. And that is by God's Holy Spirit. You can't fight a fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And this is not in your notes. You might as well just jot it down on the page there. And if you have your Bible, turn there because this is really powerful. Ephesians chapter 6. You might be familiar with Ephesians chapter 6 because you've heard before of the armor of God. Have you heard that? The armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 is the chapter about the armor of God. And the Apostle Paul uses the illustration of a soldier putting on his armor, getting ready for battle, to help to instruct us on how to defend ourselves against the devil and his attack. But I want you to see the foundational principle that Paul uses to introduce this whole illustration about the, uh, the armor of God. Look with me at verse number 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Oh man, that's so good. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Don't come at this addiction thing thinking, I just got to be tougher. I just got to be stronger. I just got to work harder. No, friend, you will not make it. You cannot do it. You do not have the power to fight it. How do, you, how do you have victory? Finally. How do you have freedom? Finally. Well, according to the verse, finally, brethren, what do you do? Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And God can do any of this. I can't, but God can. I mean, he, he doesn't have a problem with addiction. He doesn't have a, a problem with sin. God can beat it every time. And so, look at the uh, next couple of verses here. What's the next here? There it is. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. The next couple of verses, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, notice whose armor this is. It's not yours. Did you notice that? Now, we tend to think of this illustration as, okay, I've got to get my armor on. I've got to get my... No, 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 you're not getting your armor on. You're putting God's armor on. Isn't that what it says? <laughs> That's what it says. Put on the whole armor of God. What do you think God's armor is like? Well, it's not made out of tin. <laughs> it's not made out of anything that we can craft. God's armor is spiritual in nature. If God has a shield, it's not something that you can pick up and hold. It's something totally different. It's His armor. And you get to use it. Wow. You got can I follow your armor? Sure. You know how He gives you His armor? It's called the Holy Spirit. When you get saved and you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God gives you His Spirit that dwells you. God has just given you a whole set of armor. It belongs to Him. It's His. But He's just given it to you. The question is, are you going to put it on? Are we going to use it? I don't need that armor. I can do this on my own. I just got to work hard. That's all I got to do. I just got you know, I can make my own armor. You know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my own armor. In fact, I'm pretty good at woodworking, so I'm going to, I'm going to make my own little wooden, wooden uh, shield here, my wooden helmet, and all these. I can do this. I can fight this. No, you can't. The devil laughs at you when you try to make your own armor. It's not going to work. You need the armor of God. The armor of God belongs to him. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's the tricks of the devil. Verse 12. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now think about this. If your enemy was flesh and blood, then you could craft an iron 
your sword and maw them down. But that's not your enemy. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is not human. Your enemy is, is not anything that you can defeat on your own. Your enemy is the devil himself. And look at how he structures his war against you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a structure, a hierarchy of wickedness. Principalities would be the, the kind of the, the head, the rulers, the generals in that sense. And then powers are, are underneath of them. And then rulers underneath of them. And then, of course, rulers have followers underneath of them. And so this huge structure, hierarchy of demonic influence all aimed at destroying your relationship with God. And you think that you are going to beat back your addiction using a fleshly weapon. It's got to be spiritual in nature. There are things that we can use in this world that may help us deal with issues, but nothing will deliver us completely. Nothing will give us freedom unless it is spiritual in nature, specifically the Holy Spirit Himself. And so this principle is very important for us to understand that it is not possible. In other words, it is impossible. To fight your addiction and be victorious without battling spiritually. It's impossible to win. And that's why we need to look at our relationship with Jesus Christ. Number one is this. The top of your page 132. Many times we lose students because they believe the lie. What lie? The lie of the devil that the world has something to offer in their recovery. Here's what happens. People come to the RU program and they just they think to themselves, I, I just don't see how this is going to happen. You know, they keep talking about stuff in the Bible. You know, and they talk about having a relationship with Jesus, but I live in the real world. Man. You know, I'm not got I've got real withdrawal. How in the world is this stuff going to help me? And so what they do is they end up giving up on, on a relationship with Christ, a real meaningful relationship with Christ, and they go to what they think will be a quicker fix. I need counseling. I need this, I need that, and, 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 and there's, there are hundreds of solutions that doctors will give you. None of them will free you. They won't free you. So, well, what my real problem is, something that happened to me way back in my childhood. And you know what? Maybe something that you learned in your childhood, something that affected you in your childhood, maybe that begun a path in your life. But the reality is, just learning to blame a situation in the past will never give you freedom. It's not going to do it. The world today has plenty of methods that they try to come up with to help you. But you know what? That's not going to give you freedom. I want you to look at Romans 8, 3, and 4. And this is a fantastic passage. Romans chapter 8. This is the chapter. And again, this is not in your notes, so just jot it down on the side. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is the chapter of Freedom, the chapter of the Holy Spirit, the chapter where we finally find the victory that we long for. In chapter 7, and, and by the way, in the second RU class, Pastor David is teaching and he's going to get here. Uh, and so it's going to be really good. You don't want to miss out on it. But um, the chapter 7 is talking about the, the, the flesh and how we're just unable in our own ability to do it, to have victory. And there's this horrible... Uh, conundrum that Paul finds himself in, and he says, man, what wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I mean, the guy is almost suicidal. He's so <laughs> sad about the, his own flesh and how he can't have victory in his life. But 
you get to chapter 8, and Paul introduces us to the Holy Spirit, and this is where the victory comes from. So Romans chapter 8, look at verse 3, it says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. We stop there just a minute. The law is a list of rules and regulations. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do this, do this, do this, do this. Okay, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, all of us. The law, that's the law. But the law can't give you freedom. Why? Because it's weak. Why is it weak? It's weak through the flesh. What does that mean? It means that this list of rules and regulations is telling you, by your own strength, do these things, and you'll be victorious. And so you muscle up the strength and you think, okay, I'm going to obey that law. I'm going to follow that principle. I'm going to do that step. I'm going to whatever. And you, you try in your strength, in your flesh, to do it. But you find that your flesh is weak. How many of you have never broken any of the ten commandments? <laughs> <laughs>
That's why it is impossible to fight a fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. You'll try. The world does. They try and try and try and try and try. And they spend billions of dollars doing it. And they're never free. Only Christ can make you free. Look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 2 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where your faith is. Stop putting your faith in the plans and programs and wisdom and advice of men and the world. And start putting your faith in the power of God and His Holy Spirit. And you will be free. Because it's not possible to fight a fleshly temptation with a fleshly weapon. Point number two. Point number two. Pastor Joel, you've got to move here. Yeah. I know. Well, what's that good stuff? I just love it. Okay. The battle is inside of us. And it is spiritual. We've been, we've been pounding that. It's inside of us. And it's a spiritual battle. And letter A, it cannot be won with fleshly or worldly weapons. Fleshly or worldly weapons. Weapons, and of course, those weapons. We we've, we've listed some of those just now, uh, with with some of the methods that the world comes up with and people come up with. Uh, those methods will never give you the freedom that you want. The weapons that you need are spiritual in nature, and we find those weapons in this passage here, Second Corinthians ten three through five. Now, this is in your notes here, uh, and it's listed there for you. And I've got up in the PowerPoint. As well. The Bible says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Remember that, okay? You're walking, you're living in the flesh, okay? I'm seeing your flesh, you're seeing my flesh. You know, when I come up to you and give you a hug or a handshake, I'm, I'm hugging your flesh, okay? I'm, I'm shaking your fleshly hand. We live in this fleshly world. But how do we war? How do we battle? It's not in the flesh. It's not in the flesh, it's something else. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The word carnal means fleshly. That is pertaining to what you can accomplish in your ability. They're not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is the weapon that God gives us? Well, yes, He gives us His Holy Spirit, and He gives us the Word of God. And what is that for? To pull down the stronghold in your life. Well, that's, man, Pastor Joel, I'm struggling with a stronghold right now. I've got this thing, it's an addiction in my life, and it's, it's plaguing me, it's just dragging me down. How do I pull this stronghold down in my life? Well, this is something that God does through the Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, this battle takes place in our meditations, in our hearts, and in our minds. What happens is the devil feeds you lies. And he says, you're okay. You don't have to worry about this. This is not a big deal. Everybody else is doing this. The world has got a problem with this. And it's okay. And he just keeps feeding you those lies. You know? And all you have to do is get on Facebook. All you have to do is watch a movie. All you have to do is check out television. And the devil just feeds them to you. Oh, my. Over and over and over. And he never stops. How do you fight that? How do you fight lies? You want to know how to have victory over your addiction? Figure out what God says about it. What does God say about your addiction? What does God say about your sin? What does God say about your habits? What does God say about your life? What does God say? When God gives you truth, then you have something to battle the lies with. You see, we've got to pull down those strongholds by casting down imaginations. What are those imaginations? Those are the thoughts that you got in your brain. The thoughts that say, well, I can do this, or I'll be able to 
accomplish this or I can handle it. All those imaginations, those thoughts, when your brain goes to it and you think you've got a plan, those imaginations, specifically, what's the problem with them? They are high things that exalt, it, exalt itself against the knowledge of God. They are in direct contradiction to the truth of the Bible. You won't know it unless you're in the Bible. You won't be able to expose those lies. And so what is the weapon that we can use? It is the truth of the Word of God. And God's Holy Spirit takes this book and says, boom, that verse is for you. Hasn't that ever happened to you when you're reading your devotions or you're sitting in church or something and God's Holy Spirit just takes one of his verses and he just drills it right into your heart and you think, oh man, I've been pegged. I've been pegged against the pew. I've been pegged. God's Holy Spirit is using his word to cast down the lies that you have been believing. See? And so... You bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And you say, all right, that's a lie. I'm going to start believing the truth. And I'm going to capture these thoughts. And you're going to obey Christ. God, what do you want me to think? Christ, what do you want me to think? And you said the word, and you find out. Okay, point number three. To avoid an habitual action or reaction to our negative thoughts, we must cast down the thought and bring our mind under subjection to the obedience of Christ. And we're not alone in this. We have some help here. We have some help. And I'll show you what that help is in just a minute. But when you cast something down, when you cast an imagination out, that is, you immediately reject it. Do not play with it. The devil puts it in there, and your flesh starts to, oh, well, maybe, maybe that's okay. And you start playing with it, you're losing the battle. You say, well, I haven't accepted it, really. No, but you haven't rejected it, that's the problem. Cast it down. As soon as you know it's a lie, get away from it. I don't want it. And I reject that, that it's false, that it's wrong, it's a lie of the devil. And it will not work with me because I'm in the Word of God and I know the truth. Cast it down. We need some help. And the help is the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 4. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that great? You don't have to say, oh man, I can't help this. The devil is beating me down. What am I going to do? Stop it. Stop it. You've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You've got the word of God. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. You don't have to worry about that nonsense. You just stand up for the truth. Believe the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit do the work because he's stronger than your flesh. He's stronger than the world. He's stronger than the devil. And so you can trust him. We have that help. It is time that we understand, point four, that the world has nothing to offer you in your quest for the company. The world has nothing to offer you. chasing after the world and following the world's advice. And you will find yourself trying to fight flesh with flesh. And it won't work. The only way to beat the flesh is in the spirit. That's where the truth will be lies. Alright, we'll stop there. It's time to pick principle number nine up. Let's go together and pray. Thank you, Father, for showing us the truth. We need it. I pray that you would help us to identify the lies of the devil. Lord, may we use your word. May we use the spiritual armor that belongs.